I know so many of you are here on video because of my incredible appearance. Uh, but physical traits aside, we also have a podcast, and you should subscribe to that podcast. Why? Well, we've got a new series premiering this week uh, at some point. Uh, we'll tell you pretty much everything you need to know about the upcoming election uh, as we get closer to November. It's called State of the Race. It's going to be hitting your feed in the morning, the same feed that this show is on at Stu Does America. So go there, subscribe to the podcast feed now to get this bonus podcast as we go through the election season. It's going to be an important one. And don't forget to catch us on YouTube as well. If you happen to be listening on audio, go over to YouTube every once in a while. Some fun stuff coming there as well. YouTube.com slash Stu Does America. Be sure to subscribe, hit the video, uh, like the videos, hit the bell for notifications, do all the things. We appreciate it. Glenn Beck is going to be here to talk about the war on free speech in a really, really incredible way. We'll be doing that in a few minutes. Uh, Joe Biden is on fire right now. Uh, probably not in the way that you think. We'll give you the pictures. But we're going to start by doing Claudine Gay. Yes. Good luck, Claudine. This is going to be lots of fun. You know, it's interesting. Claudine Gay, of course, uh, president of Harvard. She, at least she was until very recently. as She was embroiled in several different scandals and had to step down. Uh, we are very sad to have lost her. But when you talk about a hardcore left-wing person of color that hits every intersectional mark you could possibly want. What usually goes on after something like that? If someone gets fired in that position, what usually goes on? Well, of course, all of the usual suspects, they rally and they claim racism and they say sexism and they say all the things that you're supposed to say in this situation. All the isms have been applied here and that's the reason this person has to be fired. It's not because of merit, it's because of all these other things, uh, immutable characteristics that we can't change. Well, unless of course we want to change their gender, then we can do that whenever we want, but that's a totally different situation. You'd think, though, that this would be one time that there would be an exception to that rule, right? I mean, we all watched the testimony of these three uh, heads of university in front of Congress. Again, this was testimony basically defending Jews, a group that I don't know if you've noticed in, our, in the history of the world has taken a little bit of oppression themselves. And the fact that these three very powerful, very wealthy people were in front of Congress uh, basically saying it's not against the rules of the university to call for the genocide of Jews, you'd think the oppression would be pretty obvious. Secondarily, could it possibly be race-based if Claudine Gay was only one of three heads of the university up there and only the second one to be fired? Not the first, but the second. The first one being white. Does it make any sense to blame race? You might think that it would be impossible for anyone to come up with a reason to call this racist. Well, I give you Ibram X. Kendi, who does this for a living. You doubted him, but here he is on Twitter. He said, when a racist mob attacks a black person, it finds a seemingly legitimate reason for the attack seems to be a little legitimate. Uh, that allows for it to accrue popular support and credibility, which allows the growing mob to deny they are attacking the person in this way because the person is black. Before we go on to the next uh, correction here, did you even know who Claudine Gay was before this testimony? Did, or, do you follow Harvard's leadership closely enough to know or care who's there? We know they got a $50 billion endowment. We know this is one of the most powerful institutions on earth. Certainly that's not a government. But they're being oppressed by white racists on Twitter? Can anyone believe this stuff? I mean, it's, it's really amazing. And of course, those white racists on Twitter immediately went to Ibram X. Kendi, of course, author of uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and uh, gave him a little bit of uh, the uh, community notes treatment. Other presidents of elite universities who are not black lost their jobs for similar reasons in 2023. Uh, the head of Stanford resigned over research misconduct. Liz McGill of Penn resigned over remarks regarding genocide that were substantially the same as gays. Now, of course, this means nothing to Ibram X. Kendi because he believes what he believes, and if you don't believe what he believes, you're a racist. 
So he just keeps going. He says that's how anti-black racists have been justified. The seemingly legitimate reason... <laughs> Plagiarism is not a seemingly legitimate reason, but we'll get into that. Latest case at Harvard is primarily academic misconduct or plagiarism. The question to assess is whether this was a racist attack. Uh, isn't whether, whether Dr. Gay engaged in any misconduct. So again, the merit doesn't matter here. It's not important whether she actually committed plagiarism or not. We just need to go and find out why everyone around her who wanted her to leave was so racist. The question from Ibram is whether all these people would have investigated, surveilled, harassed, written about, and attacked her in the same way if the Harvard president in this case would have been white. I, period, think, period, not, period. Now, we just gave you multiple examples of this exact thing, same thing happening to white people in the same roles. But he thinks not. He doesn't have any justification. He doesn't have any answers to all these other claims. He just blurts it out. It isn't hard to figure out why the racist mob is cheering right now and saying, go woke, go broke, and President Gay wasn't qualified, and the tide is turning against woke and DEI, and this is the beginning of the end of woke. Now, wasn't qualified is an interesting part here. One of the things that's been such an issue is she had never, I mean, the head of Harvard, never written a book. Never. Zero, zero books. Now, look, I mean, she doesn't like books. I mean, it's, a weird th it's a weird thing for the head of Harvard to have never written a book, but okay. And probably if she wrote a book, it would have sucked anyway, so we shouldn't complain that much. And she only had, what, 11, 11 papers? To find plagiarism, usually you have a, an entire you know, lifetime of words, and people go through them and pick them apart bit by bit. I mean, Fareed Zakaria comes to mind, did a monologue, did a bunch of writings, they found a bunch of plagiarism. Joe Biden made a million speeches, right? And they found a bunch of plagiarism. This has happened over and over again to people with lots of stuff on record. The thing that was interesting about Gay in particular is she only had 11 papers on record, and they found 50, 50 cases of plagiarism, 50. Now, you might note that the number 50 is higher than the number 11, meaning she's averaging more than one, in fact, almost five instances per paper. Not good. You might say, okay, well, Ibram X. Kennedy is the only person who could possibly come up with a justification to call this racism and not justified. But of course, Jamel Hill also exists. She says, when white people are hired in any position, the automatic assumption is that they were the best person. When black people, that's totally untrue, by the way. I know tons of white people who are horrible at things. I have this job. You think I'm the best person for it? No way. I suck. It doesn't make any sense. People suck from all colors, all races, all creeds. They, they suck for a million different reasons. How many restaurants or banks or construction workers have you met in your life and you think that person kind of sucks at their job? Did you ever say, well, I only assume they're very good at their job if they're white? Who does this? It only occurs in the heads of Ibram Kendi and Jamel Hill. That's where it occurs. These thoughts don't happen in any regular person's heads. You have to be obsessed with this stuff to think this way. It's, it's a sickness. It really is. Um, when black people are hired, it assumes they got where they got because of affirmative action. That's not true at all. It's not true at all. Which, by the way, doesn't mean underqualified. If the affirmative action never existed, a lot of white people would still believe deeply in their own superiority because that is what they've been taught. Now, of course, this is a lie. We've, we've covered this, and I don't have time to go into all the breakdowns of this today. We can go back and watch previous shows. We've discussed how these changes happen. It wasn't because the government led the people. It's the other way. It always happens the other way. Um, considering that there have been 30 presidents at Harvard and Claudine Gay was the first black one in history, she had to be extremely qualified even to be in that position. We just went over qualifications. It's not that impressive. There have been plenty of people who are African-American who would be qualified for this role. I mean, look, one of them was president of the United States. I mean, there have been plenty of African-Americans who wind up being qualified to get a job like that. She just didn't seem to have those qualifications. I mean, just based on the numbers and based on what she did to get there. Um, but don't let me fear, interfere with your racism, she says. Um, now, someone did point out uh, plagiarism has pesky penalties. And that is usually true, especially in academia. She says it wasn't proven that she plagiarized, FYI. Harvard didn't find that evidence. Well, let's, let's look at this claim. This claim's being made by a lot of people. There wasn't 
any evidence of plagiarism really? And if that, was that really plagiarism? Is that really what we think? Let me give you a, a great example of this. This is a reporter on CNN trying to somehow talk his way out of what plagiarism is. Watch this. It's fascinating. These plagiarism allegations uh, where Claudine Gay has had to issue corrections, um, multiple corrections. Uh-huh. Now, we should note that um, right, Claudine note. Gay has not been accused of stealing anyone's ideas okay. in any of her writings. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's been accused of sort of a, more like a copying uh, other people's writings without attribution. So it's been more sloppy ap- attribution than stealing anyone's ideas. So she's not stealing ideas. She's copying other people's words without attribution. Can you imagine living in a world where you would say that on television? It's bonkers. Now, you can go, I think what happened with this guy, honestly, if I'm going to be honest with you, we were Googling this in the middle of uh, the radio today. What is the definition? If you search define plagiarism, we were like, what is the dictionary definition? And the first one does say something about stealing ideas, the first one on the Internet. Now, of course, that's not a full definition of what plagiarism is. And we know this in particular in this context because Harvard has a definition of plagiarism. Not me, not just random sites on the Internet, Harvard itself, when they're advising students, hey, make sure you don't try to get through Harvard by stealing other people's words. Here's what they write. Plagiarism is defined as the act of either intentionally or unintentionally submitting work that was written by someone else, not ideas, work written by someone else. If you turn in a paper that was written by someone else, Or if you turn in a paper in which you have included material from any source without citing that source, you have plagiarized. It's according to freaking Harvard. Amazing. Now, if you're thinking, well, was this real? Did you really do this? Now, there are 50 different uh, accusations here. And you can go through and see them. The Washington Free Beacon, by the way, deserves a a lot of credit and a a, a victory lap on this. They were the ones, the main ones, who cited a lot of of this plagiarism. Let me give you one example, though. This is uh, from uh, when she stole from someone named Gary King. He wrote, The posterior distribution of each of the precinct parameters within the bounds indicated by its tomography is derived by the slice it cuts out of the bivariate distribution of all lines. Now, how many times have you said that? Have you said that to yourself today? You said that to a friend today, that type of language? No? Well, Look at what Claudine wrote. The exact same thing, including the words posterior and uh, even bivariate, which, again, we use bivariate so commonly. But like almost every single word, a a couple of slight uh, omissions. uh, But it's that type of stuff and times 50, right, in 11 papers. It's blatantly obvious what was happening here. Look, you know, it might have just been laziness, frankly. It might have been uh, that she really doesn't have her own ideas. Maybe she's not very good at what she does. Maybe she just was rushing. And uh, I don't think it was a mistake. I don't think it's possible that this many things could be a mistake. But it's possible it it wasn't. uh, It was just someone, a college student, trying to get through a day and not really caring. Right? I mean, but that's a massive problem. Not necessarily for you. Where do you work? You work, uh, maybe you work as a lawyer. You work as an accountant. You work uh, at a grocery store. Wherever you happen to work, your college career isn't really defined by those choices. Everyone makes bad choices in college, as we all know. But when you're in academia and you're the president of freaking Harvard, these things really matter. As defined by Harvard, who yells at their students all the time to make sure that they're not doing it. All right. There's so much here. I got to keep going. Plagiarism charges downed Harvard's president. A conservative attack helped to fan the outrage. That's what the AP review of this story reads now. That wasn't what it read originally. And it's fascinating to see that, which, again, is offensive to me. Uh, Plagiarism charges charges. Of course, it's not a charge. It was real. Um, And it's all about, you know, it's the conservatives pounce angle, right? Oh, gosh, the conservatives are making a big deal out of nothing, right? Well, here's what it said initially, which is even better. Harvard president's resignation highlights new conservative weapon against colleges. Plagiarism. That's a conservative weapon against colleges? That's not someone stealing from someone else and committing academic fraud. No, no. That's a conservative weapon 
weapon against colleges. Now, of course, readers did add some insights to that. Plagiarism is a breach of rules for Harvard University. Claudine Gay was ultimately forced to resign for a series of breaches of this policy. Plagiarism or application of the rules around plagiarism, therefore, cannot be considered a weapon. <laughs> That's pr a pretty good community note uh, on Twitter. Now, there's so much in this article to go through. Honestly, we could do the whole show on this one article. It's so bad from the Associated Press. And again, I brought this up yesterday. Imagine being in a world where your side had these sorts of resources going to defend it. I can't even imagine what it would be like. All we do is push back and fight against people lying about what we say. Imagine if people were lying to your benefit all the time. Imagine if your life was a life where every single time you had an idea, massive institutions gathered to defend every little bit of it, even when you totally screw up. I mean, it would be, you'd get very lazy in that world, but it would be lots of fun. I think. Uh, let me give you some from uh, the Associated Press. As a black person in academia, you always have to be twice, three times as good, says formerly, uh, former, his he's not formerly black, but he's former historically black, Dillard University President Walter Kimbrough said, there are going to be people, particularly if they have any inkling that the person of color is not the most qualified who will label them a DEI hire, like they tried to label her. If you want to lead an institution like Harvard, there are going to be people who are looking to disqualify you. Look, the best way to not be a DEI hire to be accused of that is to actually be qualified for the job and not steal from other people's work. But I mean, it is an interesting double standard these colleges want. They want all the credit of being diverse. They want all the credit of bringing in um, uh, African-Americans to these jobs because uh, they're breaking glass ceilings and, and, and breaking down barriers. Look, all that's awesome. If the person's qualified, you get a job because you're qualified, not because the color of their skin. How many times have we talked about this? Judging people based on the color of, your, of their skin is a bad idea. It's been proven to be a bad idea for a very long time. You should never do it. But I can't, now we have people telling us that's how we should do it. It's insanity. The allegations against gay initially came from conservative activists, some of which stayed anonymous, who look for the kinds of duplicated sentences Undergraduate students are trained to avoid, even with citation. In dozens of instances, a first, uh, first published by the Washington Free Beacon, a conservative website, Gay's work includes long stretches of prose that mirror language from other published works. Again, that's just the de dictionary definition of plagiarism. Kind of saved a lot of words by just saying plagiarism. But they, of course, tried to justify it. And they've tried to just come up with different ways of saying this, any way to shield Claudine Gay from these accusations. A review ordered by Harvard acknowledged duplicative language, duplicative language, and missing quotation marks. Can you imagine, can you imagine your teacher being like, oh, I'm sorry, you missed some quotation marks there. You didn't steal this entire paper. You just missed some quotation marks. But it concluded the errors were, quote, not considered intentional or reckless and didn't rise to misconduct. Harvard previously said, Ms. Gay updated the dissertation and requested corrections from journals. And again, I, I, I draw to that attention, that line one more time, were not considered intentional or reckless. I give you one more time, the policy from Harvard. Plagiarism is defined as the act of either intentionally or unintentionally submitting work that was written by someone else, blah, blah, blah. Again, it doesn't matter even if it's intentional or unintentional, but it doesn't happen 50 times unintentionally, guys. I mean, boys and girls, can we be serious for a second here? Um, so they had to, of course, amend what they wrote in the Associated Press once again. again I, these are all stealth edits, by the way. They're not just announcing this, hey, we made a mistake, here's our correction. No, they're just correcting it and acting like we're not going to notice. Our review ordered by Harvard acknowledged she duplicated their language without using quotation marks. Harvard previously said Gay updated her dissertation and requested corrections from journals. That was not the only stealth edit in this piece. Christopher Rufo, a conservative activist who helped or orchestrate the effort, again, another person who deserves a victory lap on this, celebrated her departure as a win in his campaign against elite institutions of higher education. On X, formerly Twitter, he wrote, scalped as if gay was a trophy of violence, invoking a gruesome practice taken up by white colonists who sought to eradicate Native Americans? Is that what scalping was? I, I kind of had the impression it was the opposite. Again, like it's been used later on for a million different reasons, usually like this, like, oh, we got their scalp. 
But no, they were trying to say it was the white settlers that were scalping the Native Americans, which is not really the way that's known, of course. Then they had to stealth edit the piece. Christopher Russo, uh, Rufo, a conservative activist who helped orchestrate the effort against gay, celebrated with scalped as if gay was a trophy of violence, invoking a gruesome practice taken up by white colonists who sought to eradicate Native Americans and also used by some tribes against their enemies. This is amazing. And of course, scalps most likely uh, used like this because they thought, I don't know, I, my guess is they were just watching Inglorious Bastards and heard the word and didn't know how to put it into their article. Each and every man under my command owes me 100 Nazi scalps. And I want my scalps. And all y'all will get me 100 Nazi scalps taken from the heads of 100 dead Nazis. Or you will die trying. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Just a classic. All right. Um, Claudine Gay continue, of course, to stay at Harvard. She's going to still make $900,000. A year. What she does not realize now is that this is the best thing that has ever happened to her in her entire life. The rest of her life will be spent collecting six-figure salaries for absolutely no work whatsoever. She will be given board seats. She will be rewarded. It is incredible to know what is in her future. Um, before we go, you wonder about the third head of the university. Let me just give you this chart. This is the ousted university president's graph. Uh, last thing in it. Here it is. You see, this is from Calshi, which is a cryptocurrency like betting service that you can bet on world events. Um, you see that Harvard, Penn, and MIT are on this. Uh, Penn rose immediately uh, to the president being ousted. Took a long time to get Claudine Gay. It was only at like 25% for a while. Rose, 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 then up to 100%. And you see at the bottom, the MIT head, been almost zero this entire time, has now risen to a 25% chance that she is outed. Certainly she is next on the target list uh, for this particular ousting effort. I want to tell you about really something really cool that Glenn has going on. You're not going to believe where I'm going to do this next segment from. It's incredible. You're not going to believe it. He's a big special. He's going to be doing from this place in just a second. We'll show it to you next. This past December, drug shortages hit a record high, and this is causing severe disruptions in medical treatments. Has this happened to you? Have you noticed this with your family members yet? There are delays, treatment cancellations, and the unfortunate rationing of vital medications. Even drugs as important as the antibiotic amoxicillin are in short supply right now, along with 294 others. This has really been undercovered. Doctors are even saying that they've been forced to make impossible choices, including choosing which patients will be prioritized to receive important care. Uh, this is why you need the Jace case. It's a personalized emergency kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. And Jace is continually working to expand their medication offerings. They even have ivermectin as an option in the Jace case if, if that's what you want. Plus, you can buy a gift card for your family or loved ones so that they can get a Jace case of their own and personalize it to their needs. Um, everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected events of today. So get your Jace case now. Go to jacemedical.com. Enter the code STU at checkout. Uh, get a discount on your order if you do that. The code STU is important for that discount. The promo code STU at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E, medical.com. I'm joined now by Glenn Beck. He has a brand new special coming up next at 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. It's Red Alert, exposing the globalist plot to eradicate free speech. And I come to you from a very long commute from over there on, <laughs> on my set to this one, yeah. which is a set you may very well recognize uh, if you are listening on podcasts. Glenn, where are we right now? We are in 1971. Uh, this is Archie Bunker's home. 704, what was it, 704... Houston, right? Uh, and this is the original set. I have the kitchen <laughs> where I have every, I'm sitting here at the table. This, I didn't even realize this. This is the plate they used on uh, All in the Family. This is the plate I grew up with. The, I mean, I ate cereal in a bowl just like this. My grandfather used to drink his coffee from this and he would pour it in the saucer so it would cool down faster, more surface area, and he'd drink it from the really? saucer. Yeah, and, I mean, and exactly this stuff. It's that's crazy. Like, I mean, that's physics right there. Yeah. That's inc impressive. Yeah. Well, he was a smart man. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the obvious question to start with, uh, 
even before why we are here, is how are we here? How do you have the original set from so, all the family? In 1980, I think, uh, Archie and Archie's place and everything was over. And so Norman Lear expected to do a reunion show. So he packed the entire setup into, a, uh, into an air-conditioned uh, storage unit. At some point he realized, that ain't gonna happen. So it went back to Viacom, which is CBS, mm -hmm. and they used it uh, at the studios just for display uh, at uh, Nickelodeon. I think it was Nickelodeon. Um, then they had no use for it, so it came up for au auction. And, you know, I'm preserving American history. And I start tonight's show with, I think the healing that happened in the 1970s, it wasn't, it, you know, how do you go from all of those assassinations, Martin Luther King, the riots on the streets, everything, how do you go and bring it all back together? Okay, Meathead from this show, <laughs> yeah. he, he was not a liberal. He is a bona fide Marxist, okay? He's talking about seizure of lands and, you know, you owners of these companies. He's a Marxist. How did we get to heal again? And I think it's this show. Because if you watch it, and I think you have recently, yeah. if you watch it, some of the most difficult conversations were happening at this table. They would sit here and they would talk and Archie would say, shut up, you, okay? But they were talking about everything. Abortion, uh, um, the size of government, racism, rape, the very first episode of any television. They were all new norms, okay? And while Archie would say, shut up, you, and, he, and Norman Lear had a point of view. He was much more a Marxist than a capitalist. So Meathead would make some points, but Archie would get him too. And he was viewed as my family, in my family, Meathead was, as one of those hippie liberals that are going to stay in uh, college the rest of their life and bleed the rest of us dry. Mm -hmm. Okay, And that's, that was said. Yeah. And so you could walk away, whichever side you were on, you could walk away and identify with somebody at the table. That allowed us to have these conversations in our own living rooms by watching others in their living rooms have the conversations. This show changed America. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because it wasn't only having those conversations. It's what happened after. And what happened after was they were still a family. Yes. Like they, I mean, all in the family. It was all in the family. It was yeah. really, the title meant something. Right. And like the, the healing process of two warring factions kind of coming together at the end was really important. When Archie, there's a couple of episodes where Meathead is just on the verge of moving out. And Archie is very excited about it. Yes. Until it comes to the moment where they're moving out. He doesn't want that to happen. He wants the family together. How many of us are living in broken families now. How many of us can sit at the table and say, shut up you, and yet still have a good relationship? Well, they're family members. Yeah, I, I it's mean, not encouraged. It, it's, it, it, a show like this could not be done today. And that's why I chose this set to do tonight's show on, because it's about freedom of speech. 2024 is going to change everything. We can talk about that later. Yeah, well, actually, let's talk about it now, because I want to I look around the set, and I want to I show some of this off if we have yeah. time. But I want to talk about what you're getting into tonight, because, I mean, you know, this was the first foray, really, for Americans in this format to talk about these issues. Um, and I feel like we've kind of come to a, we went to a place where we talked about them a lot, and now we're at the place where we're just screaming at each other. Everyone hates each other. If you bring these things up, you might lose your job. Mm -hmm. uh, we've crossed a bunch of lines, and it seems and like that, free and speech that, is in trouble. That would have been yelled about by Meathead, not Archie. Meathead would have said, you want to silence people? Yeah. You want to throw them out? You want to just get rid of freedom of speech? Now Meathead is trying to silence people. It's fascinating how everything has turned, and we're not allowed to point those things out. So um, when you look at the big picture here, right, this is not just about television. This is about 
free speech. It's about your ability to it's communicate. About our families. So what, how, how is it under threat? Well, we all know, I mean, look at Elon Musk. If mm-hmm. Elon Musk would have played ball, do you think he'd be having the problems he's having right now? Do you think the government would be coming after him? Absolutely not. Do you think sponsors would be ditching him? Absolutely not. He wouldn't play ball, and there is a public-private partnership. The governments of the world have figured out you can get past the U.S. Constitution if you have private corporations do it, and they partner with the government. So the government can say, well, yeah, we're partners, but... I didn't tell them to do that. I can't tell them to do that, even though we know they are. It's been proven that they are. And what we are going to reveal tonight is the um, when this really went into plan, there was some there were two events that happened um, around 2016 that the left went. Oh, my gosh. No, and not, no, I shouldn't say the left. The 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 rulers of the world, okay, (laughs) that saw a new world coming, stakeholder capitalism, new world order, those people, it took their breath away. Two things happened within a couple of months of each other. Bang, bang, and they did not see it coming. And so they had to develop uh, a way to control people's thoughts and information. It has gotten so bad, a lot of the information we're gonna share, it comes from uh, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi, Um, who have done remarkable work on exposing this, a whistleblower has come. We are now, our government and our corporations are in league with one another and, I don't remember, is it MI5 or MI6, which is the CIA version over there. Doesn't matter, one's their FBI and one's their CIA, same, same garbage. The Five Eyes organizations, those are the intelligence organizations of the five Western companies or countries, they're all in league spying. We're spying on their citizens. They're spying on our citizens, all in a public private. Our Pentagon is involved. It is, it's beyond what you can imagine. And you better imagine it now, and you better stand up and speak and prepare yourself for a time where you you're not going to be communicating with us. You prepare for a time when every gun is pointed your way. I mean, and it's amazing, too, that, you know, Elon Musk, you bring him up as an example, how far we've moved, right? Like, we're at the point where it's the right who's associated with the electric car guy and the solar power guy, right? Like, this has moved really far, really fast. I know you've been reading that Elon Musk book as yeah, well, and it's really up until... He keeps the factory open for COVID. Really, like all he is yeah. a as liberal icon till that moment. COVID, uh, the bailouts, all of these things, global warming—that's all part of the system of the meat grinder. That they thought they could put it all in through the media and and uh, um, and through social media and universities, grind it all up and spit it out, with you believing it in a nice little pile. And then 2016, something happens, and it all changes because they panic. Mm. Their panic was first seen in 2020, and I show you what is coming this year. And it's all documented sources. All of it is on glenbeck.com. Mm. All of the paper, all of the evidence. All right, if you're watching on Blaze TV or Pluto, wherever you happen to be watching uh, Blaze TV, that show is coming up here in a little bit. Can we take a look around here, though? Sure. Just, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. just from yeah, a fan's yeah. perspective? Yeah. Sure. So this is, how much of this is actually from the 100% set? 100% of this is the actual set. Dishes. The dishes. Pictures. I have every fork, every <laughs> napkin. I have everything from the set everything from the set. That's incredible. The only thing that is uh, kind of different is the Archie and Edith chair. Oh, really? Um, Because two of the most famous chairs in the history of America. Everybody will say they're in the Smithsonian. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember the year, but it was like 1975. um, And Carol O'Connor and Gene Stapleton were negotiating through Norman Lear and CBS. Well, these two were playing a hardball negotiation, Mm. and so is CBS, and no one was telling Norman Lear this is negotiation. These two said, 
We're not doing another episode no matter what you offer us. And CBS countered with, good, we're done with the show. Neither of those were true, okay? Mm -hmm. Hardball. Norman Lear said, are you guys out of your mind? Yeah. And CBS said, we're not doing a deal. So he gave the two chairs to the Smithsonian. Then they reached a deal. They had five more years. And he, wow. he calls the Smithsonian and says, I need the chairs back. And they said, quote, we're not a lending library. So they kept the chairs. This chair cost him $15 the first time around. He said he got it for about 50 the second time around. This chair became the most expensive prop in television history, okay? They could not find this fabric. He bought this chair originally for like 20 bucks. Mm. This fabric, just the fabric of this chair, to get it exactly the way it was, no mills, no looms could make it anymore. One factory in France could retool and make the exact fabric. The fabric on this chair cost $16,000 in 1975. Oh my God. Uh huh. So, what well, the chair over? I can't even yeah. imagine. So, the Smithsonian chairs are from the first half of the run. These are the second half of oh, All wow. in the Family. But still, five years of the show. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's the real deal. That's amazing. Yeah. Look I mean, at his look, remote control. The remote is incredible. Look at this thing. Yeah. I mean, RCA Victor, this is amazing. I mean, do, uh, would, you, would you even know? It looks like a shaver. I thought it was like an yeah. electric shaver. Yeah. It look how space age it's yeah. supposed to look. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And all the stuff, and you know, the, the stairs don't actually go. There's no, no. You know, I mean, we way. haven't built out the entire set because we're, you know, it's expensive to build sets yeah. out. Uh, so there's a lot still in boxes. The whole front porch, you know, yeah. of, the, of the set. Norman Lear passed away uh, yeah, recently. recently. His impact on television is interesting. We talked about this a little bit on radio one day in that he, some of the stuff that we complain about, like messages being inserted into programming, he kind of is the father of that. I mean, he was the first person to do it. Mm -hmm. Is his legacy positive to us or is his legacy negative? <sighs> well, he was the first one to make propaganda less obvious on television. Mm -hmm. He was against the traditional American way, but I don't think he was a communist. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was. Um, and I think the legacy of being able to have arguments honestly on television and present all sides, I think is a good thing. Yeah. All right, there you go. Glenn Beck, the special is coming up. Uh, there's a lot to it. More than just us, you know, gawking at the remote and the chairs. Um, there's a lot on the show. Don't miss it. It's a big one tonight. It's coming up next right here on Blaze TV. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. The promo code is Stu if you want to save 10 bucks. Glenn, thanks for going on. Thank you. Israel is confirming that it will defend itself from the claims of genocide in Gaza in The Hague next week. First hearing of the International Court of Justice on the South African filing accusing Israel of perpetuating genocide against the Palestinians uh, will take place next week, uh, January 11th hearing. We'll uh, see them lay out their case and then uh, they're going to defend themselves on uh, January 12th. So look forward to that. Just one of many things that are kind of crazy going on in the world right now. Now, Bernie Sanders is basically on the side of calling Israel a state of genocide. They are, he's calling for the end of U.S. funding for Netanyahu's immoral war. Now, like, say what you want about what's going on in Israel. Like, you can say, well, I think maybe they're going too far. Now, I think the opposite. I, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid they're going to stop because of all this pressure. When in reality, like, they need to make sure that their country is safe. Uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about uh, where this, if this ends too quickly, honestly. But you can have, there's differences. Rational people can have differences on approach and, and what you should do and how much you can accomplish here. Um, but to say the war itself is immoral? Like that's an incomprehensible opinion to me. I, they were attacked. They, they didn't attack first. They were attacked. They raped women. They beheaded babies. Uh, they burned. I mean, the story, if we, you missed this from yesterday, the story from the New York Times, again, the New York Times, which laid out some of the things they did just in the realm of sexual violence against these victims. 
I say I go back or I mean, I honestly, I, I would tell you not to go back and, and, and read the story because of how terrible it is. But if you if you don't believe it, go back and read it. See if you can make it your all the way through all the details on that story before you say it's an immoral war. I mean, Bernie Sanders is revolting. He really is. And just gets away with this stuff again. He's this guy who is just going to be critical of uh, even Democrats on this stuff, which, you know, at some level you think is OK because it's at least he's questioning his own side. But. Uh, the way he's doing it is really, really bizarre. By the way, his own side was in uh, uh, St. Croix. That's where Joe, with all this going on, Joe Biden was in St. Croix uh, and he got uh, a pretty bad sunburn. <laughs> Have you seen the pictures of Joe Biden with the sunburn yet? Yes, there he is. Are you looking like, I don't know, George Hamilton? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is he peeling yet? Do we know? Uh, I hope he's not peeling. Actually, if you saw the pictures of him today, he's just caked with so much makeup you can no longer see the sunburn. Um, but a couple of questions on this. Didn't he just have skin cancer? Now, look, a, a sunburn is a sunburn, but if you're a victim of skin cancer, aren't you, like, isn't there one Secret Service agent that comes down and says, like, hey, can we spray a little uh, a coconut-smelling, uh, you know, uh, lotion on you for a little bit? Some of the spray? Can I just cover you? Maybe when he falls asleep for the 14th time, you spray a little bit on the guy? Mr. I'm wearing a mask outdoors... I mean, learn the risk factors here. Uh, But other than that, like, I'm just amazed at how this stuff works. Like, you know, a a, a hurricane comes into Texas and and Ted Cruz uh, goes on, uh, goes to Cancun and he's Cancun Ted or Cancun Cruz for forever. Right right now we've got wars this guy's supposedly managing in Israel and Ukraine. We've got uh, a catastrophe on the border. You've got uh, the debt hitting $34 trillion dollars. And this guy just goes on a vacation, seven days in St. Croix, really relating to the people, and no one cares. No one cares about it at all. Not even him. He doesn't even seem to care about his own skin. That's just uh, the double standard is obvious, but also must be pointed out. Less than two weeks away from Iowa, we get into the, of course, primary season, which who knows what that's going to mean, honestly, in this uh, context. And, of course, we are into election year as well. One of the things we wanted to do is make sure you're up to date with the best information possible. And ideally to give it to you in a really concise, digestible fashion, we're going to be doing that in the mornings with a new podcast on the Studios America feed. It's called State of the Race. And you're going to get that in the same feed. You get Studios America. Nothing's going to change with our show here. We're still going to be doing it for you. And then it's going to appear in the same feed. This is only going to be available uh, audio only right now. So if you're on video, you got to go to the podcast feed. Look for Studios America and follow it up there. You'll get this podcast as well as a state of the race update. Get yourself caught up uh, in the mornings uh, with state of the race right here on the Studios America feed. Okay, so here's what happened. Uh, you ever have like a five cheese pizza? I mean, is, I think there's one maybe Domino's made for a while. It was like seven cheese. I've even seen nine cheese pizzas. That's a lot of different types of cheese. However, that's not the record. The record in 2020 was actually uh, 254 cheeses. Now, that's a lot of freaking cheese. That actually went up. In fact, it was eventually 834 cheeses on one pizza. Now, this is getting a little absurd. That record, uh, however, has been broken. A pizza topped with 1,001 varieties of cheese baked in France. Um, here's what the picture looks like. I mean, it does not look good at all. And here's the people who did it. And they, the guy there in the middle looks like he is smelling every one of those varieties of French cheese. I do not look at that as a positive. <laughs> 